Hey, what's going on? Welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show with me, your host, Agostino Zynga. And this is episode number 200, 200, 200, right? <laughs> I'm trying to be my head. I had to say number 200. But well, welcome back to the show, special celebration, the 200th episode. What an amazing time to be alive, right? Wow, 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 wow. I somehow managed to record 200 episodes of me talking into a microphone, speaking into a camera for the best part of 30 plus minutes for 200 episodes across four years, right? I think I started this thing four years ago. Um, my only one regret is that I didn't stay consistent. I wasn't consistent when I first started my podcast. You know, I kind of got on the podcast train quite early, um, considering the amount of people that have podcasts now. I was a fan from the very beginning. Um, you know, when it kind of burst onto the scenes, I was, you know, I spent most of my time listening to podcasts, which I really do now. I don't, I don't hardly watch any kind of TV or TV series. I miss quite a lot of things because I spend all my um, available minutes either consuming podcasts or listening to music for my, you know, obvious um, DJing side gig. So um, podcasts have be, have become a, a huge part of my life. They've informed a lot of my life decisions, uh, whether or not to, you know, take certain substances whether or not to go to certain places in terms of holiday, whether or not to drink certain uh, beverages or even alcohol. I've gotten into whiskey podcasts now recently. I've gotten into natural wines through podcasting. I've gotten into CrossFit through podcasting. I've increased my running capacity because of, because of podcasting. Um, so many things, so many different things. I've formed my life. Um, I've formed my life perspective. I've formed my moral compass. I've discovered philosophy. Um, I've discovered... Um, or I've kind of enacted or turned on my rational side of my brain. I've got I've pulled away from being super engaged in politics and gotten into personal responsibility. I've run away from collectivism and gone back to individuality. Like loads of real awesome cool things have happened because of podcasting. And really I have nothing um but gratitude really to the podcasting ecosystem and universe out there for really being um, open and giving me these podcasts where I can kind of tap into um, the various episodes I want to listen to and really, you know, extract some value in it and act on it. And I think like um, most things, right, like the books I have behind me, it's no, um, there's no good just um, listening to a podcast. You have to actively listen to them. Like, you know, there's that term active reading. Um, and that is just, you know, reading what you're um, t taking actual care to try and understand or comprehend what you're reading, not just reading the lines on the page and kind of trying to get through as many pages as you can, but actually trying to um, let whatever you're reading really marinate or really sit within your soul and it kind of and then trying to and then using whatever that's you whatever is read as a kind of uh compass to lead in the right direction right enacting enacting some kind of change in your life that's how you're meant to do the things you're meant to do and i guess for me from you know starting off listening to the tim ferris show the random show and then going into that kind of deep dark hole and then you know discovering those other different individuals like seth going in free podcasting i've decided to kind of you know take my take the lessons i've learned on an active in my life you know like you know just the other day i mentioned the Laird Hamilton and Joe Rogan podcast where they're speaking about nose breathing and that's something I've kind of, you know, been familiar with since I've been following people like Brian McKenzie and stuff. But I've taken it that into action. I'm starting to apply that when I go running. Yeah, I'm starting to try um, and, you know, take do some nose breathing when I'm running to try and see if that works for me. Um, whether it's a Wim Hof method, right? I did that for like a month and I saw the benefits of that. Just little different things that have really kind of uh, been beneficial to my life overall. And I have, yeah, nothing but gratitude really. Nothing but thanks and gratitude. And of course, for my own 200 podcast episode, I'm just thankful for everyone that's listened, really. Whether it's one, two, three, ten, twelve, a hundred. Um, thank you so much for downloading. Thank you so much for playing. Thank you so much for tuning back in week after week, um, hearing me ramble and talk about, you know, random things that I found on the internet or just to um, talk about my life uh, goals, talk about how I view the world. It's really, really, um, how do I say? Um, really humbling, really. Yeah, really humbling. Again, I've not been, I've, I've not been the most uh, uh, productive person. I think over the last few years, I think I've procrastinated probably a lot more than I probably have produced. Um, but I did take an active, I did, I did make an active decision to make sure that I contributed more to culture than I did in terms of commentate. Right, I've been on the sidelines for the longest time. Um, I've been a consumer for most of my life, but I haven't been um, forthright in putting across my my vision. Um, uh, 
in any way, shape or form. And I guess this is just my first step in doing it, right? There is still an element of commentary to this, right? Because I am, quote unquote, reacting to things online or I am giving my opinion on things or whatever it may be. But I try to offer a different spin than what people are offering now on social and just try to come at it from a more um, sympathetic, um, uh, empathetic point of view in that respect. And I hopefully I do that for the most part. And again, I just have nothing but gratitude for those of you that listen. And yeah, I hope in the next couple of episodes or next next the next 200 episodes uh this podcast gets stronger and stronger and better and better and i guess i mentioned before i'm getting a new camera i'm getting a new microphone in very soon i'll hopefully have another mixing panels or to kind of you know make sure the levels are all good but so far you know being able to share this via the medium of youtube and share this via the medium of podcasting platforms or streaming platforms has been a real blessing and i have nothing but gratitude for those of you that listen so thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyway, um, because I don't like to dwell and because that stuff is boring, let's get into the podcast. Got my cup of coffee here, as you can see. My hands are covered in cocoa butter, so it makes it a bit hard to hold it. But hey, ho, c'est la vie. Just cheers to that. It's Wednesday morning. Let's get started and talk about some subjects we, we think are interesting. Let's go, let's go, let's go. So got a lot of things to run through, so let's get started. Number one, I want to wish... um. I want to say get well soon to Kit Harrington, and if you're wondering who Kit Harrington is, Kit Harrington is the actor that plays um, Jon Snow in Game of Thrones. Um, we've kind of all, you know, um, got to know him a lot over the last ten years or so since the beginning of Game of Thrones and the end. But unfortunately, some news came out recently that um, he's actually uh, suffering, uh, maybe as a consequence to the role that he played, because you know, as we know, most actors out there when they're given their all to a role, they kind of leave a bit of themselves on that set, right? They don't, ne- they never usually come back the same. And I guess Kit is having to deal with that. Um, unfortunately, the news um, today was that um, he's checked himself into rehab for personal issues. Um, it says here, Kit Arrington, Game of Thrones star, getting help for personal issues. And the article says as follows, Game of Thrones star has been checked into a wellness retreat in the US, reportedly for stress. The actor who was known for playing Jon Snow began getting treatment several weeks ago, according to page six. He published his top radio on news beat that Kit was working on personal issues. In a recent interview, Kit spoke of a huge heave of emotion after three in the final season of Game of Thrones, which worked on for eight seasons. In a different interview, the 32-year-old actor told Esquire that it was like filming Jon Snow's final scenes. The final day shooting, I felt fine, I felt fine. And then when I went to do my last shot, I started hyperventing a bit. And then they called rap and I just broke down. It was an onslaught of relief, grief about not being able to do this again. A documentary about the end of Game of Thrones called was released on Sunday. It showed Kit Harrington crying when he learned about the character's ending. Um, Kit, who was in the Game of Thrones from the first episode to the last told variety about the effects of working on such an intense show for a long period. You have these jokes, you have these in-jokes, these relationships that fr- that fry for eight, eight years, he's explained. That's a long time for those jokes to be going and they never felt old or tired. In the last season, I was like, these are getting tired now. And I think they got tired because we could see the end coming. That's a way of emotional detachment for something. Relationships very slightly starting to strain, just on the edges, just frayed. The final series of the show, based on the books, so song received mixed reviews, blah, blah, blah. Earlier this month, Kit's, Kit's co-star discussed how growing up in a public eye felt like pressure. Yes, you mentioned it too. So, again, um, I guess uh, just extending my good wishes, I think we've all kind of experienced the fruits of his labor. We've all been very um, happy to enjoy in his best moments. And I think now we have a responsibility as consumers, as watchers, to also send some love out there to Kit and his wife, um, Rosie, who are going through a tough time and just give them as much e-support as we can. You know, I'm not sure how far it will go, whether or not it will resonate, but I have a good feeling that um, the Game of Thrones community will kind of gather around and really send their well wishes to Kit. Because, you know, like I said, um, um, I think the combination of the season, you know, dragging on as long as it did, the intense nature of the storylines and the involvement, the fact that it was all consuming, they didn't really do much projects outside of Game of Thrones. The fact that Kit Angton was so attached to the Jon Snow character, made it his own, like all the other great actors in the show, Emilia Clark with Daenerys and so forth, so on. Um, the fact that the last couple of seasons have really received mixed reviews, maybe you say season six and season eight have kind of really took a real big nosedive. The fact that the last season now, the season eight with the petition, I, I heard now it makes sense why somebody um, who I respect in the acting world, I forgot who it was, said something along the lines of the petition that they put out, which, you know, again, was the petition against the actors. It was most a petition against D and D Dan and Dave, right? The Dan and Dave, um, who people have kind of um, jokingly called uh, dumb and dumber. It was most a petition against them, 
they went to refilm season eight because they felt as if those guys kind of took their foot off the pedal and just kind of, you know, rushed things a little bit and the writing got a bit lazy. But I do remember uh, an actor saying something along the lines of um, that petition was very disrespectful because it's going to come across as if like you're dissing the actors, right? When in fact, I think loads of the subreddits, loads of the forums, loads of the people on Twitter who kind of commentate on Game of Thrones were making it very clear that it wasn't about the actors. But I think it just got, it, unfortunately, it was going to be interpreted the way like, you know, you weren't happy how the actors performed. And I, and I don't think anyone would say that. I think for the most part, the casting, the actors, the stage, the, the, the costume design, the stage settings, whatever they do, the location filming, the filming itself, the cinematography, the special effects are stellar. It was painfully obvious that the writing was what really let, let it down. And if you look at some of the clips of the earlier seasons, you can see why. But the, that actor says something along the lines of, you know, it's going to be disrespectful and the actors are not going to take it well, right? See, the petition is going to be like a slap in their face. And I guess now we're seeing what why that actor was so against the petition because stuff like this happens, right? You got, he's already dealing with his own emotional issues going through the last season and you saw a clip where he kind of read the final chapter and read what he was going to happen to Jon Snow, him going to kill Daenerys and he kind of broke down in tears. And at first you look at that and you don't really understand why it's so an emotionally charged thing. But, you know, putting into perspective that you're working on a show with the same group of people for eight years, right? It's a it's a cult show. It's it's a blockbuster cult show, right? Well, things that don't really go together sometimes. Right? Cult classes are usually films that or TV series that are not received well in the beginning. And then over time, they kind of become ironically good. Um, this is a blockbuster from the minute what from from out of the gate, right? It kind of smashes the the ratings and viewing records, and then it kind of be, then goes on to be a cult classic because you know it's got the fandom from the books coming in, it's got people that are fans of fantasy coming in, it's got all these different people coming in from sci-fi, all kind of lumping in together and banding around this series. So I'm not surprised that you know that kind of pressure would kind of um, get to this kind of breaking point, and you only have to look at somebody like um, Heath Ledger and Joker and see how how detrimental. Um, great acting can be to great actors, right? It can really take a lot out of you and really leave you um, a shell of the human that you are. But I'm hoping that's not the case with Kit Harrington. I'm sure he has a great um, people around him, friends, family, his wife, uh, co-stars who are going to be banding around him and helping him out as much as possible. But again, I think that this is kind of a warning shot to most Game of Thrones fans out there who are sick and tired of season eight and uh, and hate what Kit and I so hate what Dan, Dan and Dave done with the season and the writing. I think this is probably a good sign for us to kind of take our foot off the pedal and kind of relax with the onslaught of hate online and just say, look, it is what it is. Most most um, most series that we watch kind of die out towards the end, right? I think Wire, The Wire is a good example. It kind of had a bit of a blip in, in the middle. The Shield also kind of fell to kind of live to expectation. CSI Miami is a you know a really low ball kind of comparison, but that got really old really quickly. Um, series kind of go through ebbs and flows, right? There's not really a series out there that because it was consistently great from season one, season eight. It's just really hard to do especially with changing in writers and different sort of production um, issues and budgets and expectations from the studio. It's just a hard thing to kind of get right all the way through. I think for the most part, Game of Thrones did a good job. It was 60% great, maybe 70% great, and it kind of fell off towards the end. That is what it is. We live and let learn. Um, it was a great memory. There's prequels to come that may be able to kind of resurrect or maybe able to kind of erase some of the bad before. But I think this is a good time to maybe take your foot off the pedal with the hate and kind of let the show be what it is and let the actors kind of move on and, and seek other things that they're interested in. But again, like I said, um, get well soon, Kit Harrington. Um, we'll send my love and support to him and his family and hope, you know, uh, things kind of work out for the better for them in general. Um, and then moving on from that, what else do I have here? Uh, oh actually um this is a good one i think that might be tying into the whole actor side of it this is an interview that i've just saw recently right um on a youtube show that i haven't really um paid attention to previously but i saw some interviews pop up on my on my um on my discovery page on youtube so this is an interview with is this is one i've got let me pause it here so this is, this is an interview with um it's off camera with sam jones i'm not sure who sam jones is i'm not sure if this is a real popular thing that everyone's familiar with but essentially it's the modern version of inside the actor studio right where he interviews um actors and actresses and kind of talks through their career their pitfalls and, and all that sort of malarkey and it's a good interview because uh, usually for the most part actors are quite guarded in terms of what they speak what they speak about they don't really give long form interviews for the most part they seem to keep them to themselves and if they do they try to give them to people who are respective in the industry who can kind of dig in a bit deeper and get away from all the gossip and rumors that tabloids are interested in and just get to the whole kind of craft of acting the philosophy the philosophy that goes into some of their life decisions 
um, how they pick roles, really the minutia of things that I think actors and actresses around the world will kind of geek out on, right? And I think this Sam Jones guy does a really good job of, of interviewing um, some of these guests and really get into the heart of the issue and really kind of, you know, um, drilling down onto it. And um, I saw, I, I quickly checked on on, um, on uh, Netflix and it appears to be like it was, I think it was on Netflix for the first three seasons and now I think he has his own standalone side that you can kind of subscribe to. I think you pay a monthly fee and you can, you know, watch videos of, you know, actors actually going through the interview process. But I thought this interview here was very telling. It was with a, a, Sarah, a lady called Sarah Goldberg um, from HBO's Barry and she kind of talks about how she detailed um, talking about her fame, right? Her the, her kind of, you know, battle with fame over and I thought it was a, quite a cool bit here. I think I'm going to try and get to it. Where she speaks about this idea of not trying to be famous, right? She tried to go into acting to be an actor and not to be famous. And that um, she only got into acting because... Uh, what did she say? Yeah, I think she said she only got into acting because she wanted to get... No, she she only got into acting... No, she, she only had to go into acting because she was on Broadway... And she felt like she wasn't getting any roles now because all the actors were coming into Broadway. So now she's kind of got into, you know, be, being more visible and, you know, being in a hit TV show, which is HBO's Barry, that's been getting loads of rave reviews, but I haven't got around to watching it. She's kind of doing that in order to get famous enough so she should just go back into uh, a kind of relative an anonymity and kind of revert back to type there which is kind of a weird way to go about uh, having a successful career but really interesting in terms of the current climate we're living in now i'm just trying to find a clip here hopefully it kind of loads here let me see if i can find it and that's going to be your answer i i i am a curious person and i'm searching but i was pretty sure that the answer didn't li lie in that in and fame, yeah i know and and uh, and i saw a lot of my friends become really famous really quickly and that being really difficult and and not being able to get their anonymity back or their freedom but equally I was playing these great parts in, in the West End and on Broadway and right. and then you realize oh now movie stars are doing all these parts and 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 I was nervous that if I don't do something that has some kind of visibility these parts are gonna stop happening as well right that weird paradox yeah how weird is that right how strange is that that you're an act you're an actress on actor right and you're worried about whether or not you're going to be getting other parts or you're worried about keeping your position where you are because now suddenly um the actors from famous you know hit shows or movies through maybe mismanagement of their career maybe because they're not as influential or well known or as in a spotlight as they once were previously are now kind of infiltrating and coming into your zone it must be such a weird mind fuck really it must be super super strange but then again like i said i think it goes to i think it goes to the current climate i think i mentioned it to somebody i think i might mention it to a friend i think i said over the years i think um you know with the whole um i think i mentioned kim kardashian in this i said I think the the reason why Kim Kardashian has become more like um socially accepted, I think, has less to do with the you know releasing a prison, releasing uh, people in prison and stuff, right? From um, non uh, non violent offences, which is obviously something really admirable. Her going to law school is really admirable. Her kind of you know deciding to you know have a massive family is really admirable. Something about because again she could be in quite selfish and be make it all about her. People might still say she's selfish, but the fact that she's you know taking a step back and kind of gone into motherhood is really admirable too for her career because I'm sure other people in a position probably wouldn't want to have done that. Um, there's things that she's done that are admirable. But I think but I think a lot of it has to do with I think over the years um, we've seen the Kardashians as a family maintain their level of visibility throughout all the cycles of fame right consistently maintain it we haven't seen a big change in their kardashian show i've watched clips and it's you know fairly basic um which kind of speaks to the real success of it right it's something i've never watched i'll never kind of get into and watch because it's not for me but there is something very organic about how they are right you watch the show and it's, it's incredibly boring it's incredibly inane they're just here you know whining and you know uh not whining but they're just you know going on and on about you know their life they're just you know it's pretty basic right it's about them talking about dinners and people missing stuff and infighting it's just you know whatever they're, they're, they're not dressing it up there's no glitz and glamour so it's not like love and hip-hop they're consistently themselves they're consistently visible they're always posting stuff everything seems like a calculated marketing execution whether they go on the family holiday whether they go on the dinner whether it was the jordan woods situation everything is visible 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 and i think what's happened over the years is that we've as a public we've kind of still stepped back and said you know what i find it really difficult as a human right we all sat back and find it you know i find it really difficult as an individual 
to update my Instagram without feeling yucky, right? Without cringing, without feeling embarrassed at myself that I'm taking another picture of this avocado and toast. I'm taking another picture of me eating a burger. That I'm taking a picture of me having shots with my friends on the weekend. You feel quite, you, you feel a little bit disgusted, right? You feel a little bit dirty that you're doing it, but you do it because, you know, you want to maintain your social media presence. You want to be active on there. You want to document it so to create. You want to do all those cu- cute things. You want to maybe become an influencer. You do what you need to do in order to kind of, you know, maintain your visibility. But you feel a bit dirty. But then you think to yourself, wow, if I feel dirty on my little micro level, right? My little micro influencer level, 500 followers, 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 5, 10, whatever it may be. Imagine what the collections must feel like. Or more, uh, more so, that is, you start to understand and realize that what they're doing is natural talent. The idea of wanting to become famous, the idea of doing the things necessary to keep that fame, the idea of chasing that fame, the idea of maintaining that fame, wherever it may be, is incredibly difficult. And it takes a lot out of a human. Most humans can't be that... Um, self-involved right it it, it 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 takes a level of detachment a level of understanding of who you are um it takes real talent to do that and i think we're starting to realize that that actually you know what this fame thing is talent because we know we have friends in our friendship circle i know i have friends in my friendship circle who don't miss any influencer event right i think i mentioned it before there's um what is it it's a it's the heron Preston t-shirt the influencer slipstream right or the influencer world tour there are certain events that you have to go to right if you're an influencer you want to be seen at certain things right whether it's london fashion week paris men's fashion week um coachella uh, the, uh art basel miami um what's your thing uh moma or new york art book fair the new or moment wherever that other one is there's a few others right things that you have to go to and they consistently go they don't have anything on no one's flying them out they just save their money and they go to these things just to be visible and you know how much work that takes then they get there you have to document their whole time they have to live stream they have to post pictures on instagram they have to take film pictures they have to take someone have to take a picture of their outfit it's just consistent 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 visibility which really takes a lot out of you right it makes you nervous makes you self-conscious you have to always think about your outfits it's tiring work to do so I think we've realized that that is talent. I think with this actress, what we're realizing, what she's saying is that, yeah, you get into you get into acting, you get into a certain profession, and you start to realize that, you know, the beauty of social media, the beauty of all these, you know, these industries for the most part is that there's various lanes that you can go into that can make you money, right? And I think now we've kind of reframed success and we kind of understand success isn't just being visible. Success is doing what you love every single day, right? That's what success is, right? It's not about whether or not you're the most famous person. It's about doing what you love. So even if you're playing in the second division of the Premier League, but you get paid week to play the game that you love. You play for a club that you that appreciates you. Your family are, are well off. Your kids are are in a good school, and they're not wanting for anything. That is success. You might not be Ronaldo. You might not be Messi. But you're not. You're comparing yourself to the top one percent of population. But then over time, we start. We realize, you know, with people having businesses just selling jam on Instagram and shit, that that is what success is. Not just it's not just about building the next social media platform. It's about doing what you love consistently day in day out. And I think actors and actresses have been the last to realize this, right? They've been the last of the of the of the kind of entertainment people to realize that that's a thing. I think musicians are kind of going through that stalemate now at the moment, where you don't need to be the most visible person to not to good career, right? It's that one thousand true fans rule, right? You have one tribe. You have one thousand true fans that pay for your music that come and see you play wherever you wherever you come and play whether it's in their town or on tour they buy your merch that's enough you don't need to be drake right you don't need that because that, again that takes a certain amount of a certain amount of talent certain amount of luck certain amount of ability certain amount of exposure whatever it may be you need to there's things that you need to do there's things that only he can do like visibility wise and not a lot of people would want to do right and that's a, a real thing and i think this actress is this actor sorry um Sarah Goldberg realized this really early on and I think that's a really really key part to the whole interview that I thought was very interesting but let's continue to a little bit more of it yeah of having to become famous to be an ombus I know I know I know like having to become famous like, to like do to all get a name fraud, right so that you can yeah. <laughs> yeah to go back to working for 600 bucks a week yeah and you know it's I don't know I I'm it's it's an interesting ride this and with very and you know what as well i'm thinking about this too you know what this might explain do you remember the whole thing with constance Wu from um crazy Rich asians right constance Wu um got into a bit of a social media scuffle because people were really pissed off that um i think it got announced that fresh off the boat was renewed for another season and she's one i think she plays the mother in fresh off the boat which is based on eddie hong's uh, memoir loosely based on his memoir 
Eddie Wong, sorry. And um, she got annoyed on social media, like, oh, she got pissed off. Oh my god, oh, god this is the most terrible news ever. They got it got renewed, and people were really annoyed by it. Like, what the fuck? You should be grateful you have a job. This is disgusting. How could you be so ungrateful? Blah blah blah. But they could again. She might have been bratty about it. She might have gone about it the wrong way. And her apology was god awful. She 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 started off blaming everyone else but herself, and then went on at the end of it to say believe all women or something, which is really bizarre. But anyway, I think taking away whatever she done wrong, looking at it as as a whole, it might explain that what she was actually complaining about was the idea that her life would never be hers anymore, right? Because she's going to be filming movies, which is going to take a lot of time out of your schedule, and then she'll be filming a TV series, right? Which again will take a lot of time out of your schedule too. So really, in effect, she probably would hope she most actresses and actresses, even though, you know, TV roles pay a lot con- con- consecutively, con- concurrently, right? But you get paid per episode. It still takes a lot out of you and it, and it means that you remain visible to the populace for, for a longer time period, right? Especially if it ends up getting syndicated. So there's, there's no end and you can't go back to your normal life anymore, which you probably couldn't because the Creative Rich Agents was a massive hit, in, especially in the Asian market and in the world overall. Um, that might explain why she had that really weird reaction to stuff and um, this idea that you don't want to be it's a really strange lever of famous right you don't want to be that famous because i'm sure there's actors and actresses out there who kind of really appreciate what someone like the rock does he might not be the best actor but they know that that requires a certain person to do that sort of thing to film those big blocks blockbuster movies to maintain his physical appearance to fly to all these premieres all over the world to talk at all these press junkets to go on all these um talk shows or panel discussion shows and try and make it fresh and you know this constant smiling in the camera because i've heard rumors that he's he's supposed to be not the nicest person in real life the rock but it makes sense right because he's having to turn it on and be this happy-go-lucky big friendly giant all the time that when he's in his real day-to-day life there's no need to kind of keep up that pretense right he just needs to just go back and revert back to how he actually is um, but again, very interesting interview. I recommend you check it out. Um, an interview with Sarah Gold, but I won't play the rest of it because they probably end up getting pulled off YouTube anyway. It's probably end up already get pulled. But I'll link in the show notes for you guys to check out. Um, really cool, really, really, really cool interview. And again, it might explain why Contest We was really annoyed that Crazy Rich Agents got renewed for another season. Um, I think things are things are not always as they seem. It's always good to kind of dig a bit deeper and kind of figure out why would this woman have this kind of reaction to a show getting renewed? It makes doesn't make any sense. You've got a job, innit? That's awesome, really. But it's like, mm, really, is it awesome though? It's sort of like when they um it's kind of like when they tell you at work, oh, if you work um if you work an extra day, if you work during a bank holiday, you get double pay, right? It sounds good on paper, but sometimes your free time is worth more than money, right? That kind of break from work, the idea that you're gonna get three day weekend, a time to re- recuperate, maybe go away out, maybe go out of your town with your partner with some friends, and you know just chill out a bit, recharge, and come back into work refreshed. That's probably more beneficial to you and the company than actually taking the t- the time and a half pay. Which on paper sounds like good, but you know, after tax and all that sort of lucky, you won't even recognize you've got any extra money in the end of it anyway. So it's probably not worth it going on and on and on. I think so anyway. That's just my opinion from the outside in. But what do I know? What else here is on the list? Da, 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 da. Oh, Brennan Shaw review again. Okay, cool. Because this, I'm only mentioning this again because my previous video from CBS got kind of taken offline. So apologies for you guys that tuned in yesterday and heard me speak about it. But I've got uh, a couple of things to speak about, right? Because I think this Brendan Shaw hate online is getting a little bit too, it's getting a little bit too much for me. And I'm not really comfortable with it. And I kind of, you know, again, because I made another video about Brendan Shaw must be stopped. And I think, you know, Brendan Shaw, the Brendan Shaw hate needs to kind of chill out and relax. Okay. So first off, Yes, it's true. For the trolls out there, for the people that don't like trolls, I'm just referring it loosely. I know some of you guys aren't trolls. You're just, you know, uh, you're being objective and saying that the special is horrible. I understand it. So let's just say for the people that don't like the special. No, let's, let's not use quotes. For people that don't like the special. Yes, you're right. The special is not good, right? If you compare it to other comedians out there, other comedy specials out there, it doesn't even, it doesn't come close and it's not up to par. I understand. Yes, Brendan Shaw can be annoying. I get it. He has some personality quirks. The quirks that make him or quirks, the quirks that make him successful or that have gotten him to his platform are also the ones that could um, rub people up the wrong way. Yes, his fight analysis is null and void for the most part on uh, the Below the Belt show, which a lot of people are annoyed about. He has a show on Showtime or on YouTube called Below the Belt where he spends, you know, the majority of the beginning of the show talking about his life and gives you an update, which is, you know, quite entertaining for the most part because he doesn't really get into it sometimes on the fire and the kid, but he doesn't spend that much time Fight analyz- uh, analyzing fights, which he obviously admittedly says he's not Luke Thomas, but you know a little bit of analysis will be good. He doesn't watch the prelims, doesn't watch the undercards. He only watch the main card, the main events. 
um the new the kind of the round the, the roundup of news that they do with chin and the other dude in their in their office i think in their production team where they run up some of the mma news he it seems quite disinterested in and overall he seems quite disinterested disinterested in the sport of mma overall maybe because of his history at ufc blah blah, blah. okay i get it his relationship with his relationship on t5k with brian callan it looks a little bit strange looks like sometimes he doesn't let brian callan finish his thoughts i know sometimes brian callan can be a bit annoying with the way he kind of colors some of his stories i get that true um he can sound like a bully sometimes brennan shaw bs with the story of pushing that guy through the window i understand um it seems like he only got there because of joe rogan yes that on paper or on first sight that could be true too all those things are more than obviously true right um theo vaughn is more funny than him on be the uh, on the king of the sting yes it's true but he also missed that himself fine all those things to one side that's completely true but what also is true is that this is his first special, right? It's only three years in. He probably should have done it so early, but I'm assuming it has something to do with the fact that he's in bed with Showtime. They've invested a lot of money into him. They really think he could be their next big star with Paulie Malinaji going off and doing whatever he's doing with bare knuckle boxing and being a bit of a wayward soul in that regard and not really, you know, investing in his production. Because I think, you know, Paulie Malinaji could easily do what Brendan Shaw is doing with his own breakdown show with, you know, push and put money into him. But he's maybe not the most, you know, stable of characters in order to kind of do that thing with. And I think Brendan Shaw maybe is a little bit more business minded and sees kind of the long game in things. So that may be his reason why they're putting the money into him. But regardless, the except that Showtime, you know and again you have to you have to understand as you as old school and as kind of slow to move as the entertainment industry is there are some real killer operators in that scene right some people that really know the exact science of how to build a show how to garner retention how to retain that attention how to court controversy um outrage virality whatever they know what they're doing right so all these things that you're feeling the way that you post stuff online and you're tearing them down you like Put it in your mind that there might be someone behind the scenes that is actually dropping these little things out there and kind of playing everyone like a puppet so that you know Brendan Shaw remains visible out there because again you know his visibility in terms of of a commentator on MMA or commentator yeah a commentator on MMA on the community on a, or in a comedy community overall is really unrivaled right is probably the only one outside of maybe Joe Rogan so that's great so I think you have to kind of you know put your hate to one side and kind of think, you know what, if uh, if a company like Showtime is investing that much money into him and he seems to, you know, I just listened to the Below the Belt now and he's getting a new studio that's going to be um, all encompassing. It's going to host his Below the Belt. It's going to host King of the Sting. It's going to host Fire and the Kids. He doesn't have to move locations. That again shows, you know, they really invested in his overall project. Um, it's just, it seems like he's going on for strength to strength, right? It doesn't seem like he's wanting for a lot of things, right? He picks and chooses the movies or TV roles he auditions for. He doesn't need to do that. He goes on tour often. So there's other up uh, the other factors at play that would play into the fact that he got the special. It's not just that it's, he didn't get the special based on talent alone. We know that, right? He's aware of that too. But I think the offer was just too good to do it now. And I also think if you're Brendan Schaub, why not take the opportunity to do a special right now at three years in? So that when you do your next one, the the golfing class, or sorry, the golfing quality will be really adamant. It'll be really obvious how be much better he's got. And if he's as determined and as hard working as he makes it seem he that is it as he says he is or as we've seen he has a, has been over the years i have no doubt that the next one will be much better now it doesn't mean the next one will be much just because the next one will be much better than the first one that would be much better than anything else on the scene i still think that comedy like all other aspects or like all other entertainment fields they don't um the stars i don't you can't really compare kevin hart and um i don't know and um, who's the poker person can compare him to? Yeah, you can't even compare Kevin Hart and Dave Chappelle. They operate in two different areas, right? Even though they're both, you know, mega mega star comedians, or, you know, as Kevin Hart, as I say, rock star comedians, you could probably fill an entire stadium full of people. They're not the same kind of comedian, right? They, op they operate in different lanes. And I think... What we're seeing now is maybe the evolution of comedy and we're maybe seeing Brendan being the, the first of his kind of kind to burst that through that scene because it's like, imagine if Jake Paul decided or Logan Paul decided to do, do comedy, right? It would probably go the same way as Brendan Schaub, right? After two or three years, right? They'd be, you know, in, within, within a space of a year, they'd be selling out arenas all over the place, right? Within two or three years, somebody will want to put money in their pocket and do a comedy special, whether it's YouTube, Netflix, HBO, someone will want to invest into them just because they want to tie them down and get them to do shows on their platform or on the network. It would be, the, it would work out the same way. 
So their lane of their line, their lane of comedy in the same way that you know some of the guys on YouTube get annoyed with all those um, Vine comedians. It's not the comedy that we're used to, right? It's not the uh, punchline punchline comedy. It's not the really intricate storytelling comedy that we're used to with some of the real pure kind of comedians. But it's a type of comedy, right? And a type of audience that like it. And if you watch the show, the Brandon Shaw Beauty Surprise Show, it looks like people were laughing, people were having a good time. He was having a good time on stage. And if you go through his Instagram stories, he's reposted people that have had a good experience watching it. People do like what he puts out there, right? They're a big fan of it. So I think for some of the haters out, there's some people that don't like what he's doing. I think it's okay to have two thoughts in your brain, right? To hold two opinions at the same time. Yes, he's maybe undeserving on paper of this special and the special lacks in quality or it may be obvious talent than some people out there. But again, comparing it to top 1% of talent comedians isn't fair. He's only three years in. And he didn't just get the special based on ability alone. He got it because of all the other things going for him, all these other um, bases that he's been able to cover. And I think he's probably the only one maybe in that kind of area, maybe outside of Joe Rogan, who's really been able to ace all of those kind of areas, right? Whether it's podcasting, whether it's appearances, another podcast, whether it's um, writing and all that. He's really, really trying to kind of build up his, his overall brand empire. And then to get to a point where, you know, the numbers speak for themselves, right? Regardless of what people say or how they review stuff, they're going to keep checking the Showtime special. When the next one comes out, people are going to want to hate watch it anyway. So I think sometimes, like I said, like I mentioned the other day, I wish we could get to a point in, in life where if you didn't like something, you just didn't watch it. You just didn't pay any mind to it. But I think sometimes with the level of amount of hate that they're giving this, with the amount of attention they're giving it, with the, the amount of times people are going in these comments and trying to say stuff to him and trying to write bad reviews, you're only garnering more attention and more eyes to it. People are just going to be naturally intrigued about watching what this train wreck is. And when you watch it, you're like, it's not necessarily a train wreck. It's just novice. It's just a really, it's just a really young comic doing his thing. But again, like I said, like he's taking a punt. He's put himself out there, which is a lot. It's a lot. Again, for some people out there, commentators, you're not going to care, right? About that whole line of thinking, but it's a big deal, man. Putting yourself out there, even me on this low level of doing this podcast, recording with a webcam, sitting here in my fucking, you know, in my jeans and my denim jacket, right, talking shit into a microphone, it's a lot to put yourself out there. It takes a lot of balls. It's not easy to to say, okay, cool, I think I'm good at this and I'm going to put it out there because, you know, you essentially think, you're, you're essentially, um, what are you saying? You are essentially rating yourself in some regard, right? You are essentially saying to yourself, you know what, I'm good at this. I'm going to put it out there. And then people are having to judge it. You know, you've, you've worked on this for three years. You've been harnessed. You, I, think, I think you said he did over 100 shows with that same routine and you know tightened up bits and pieces over there so you've done you've done the work you've put in as many reps as you can right and then people have just got an hour to kind of critique it or maybe less than an hour to critique you i think i've seen people say they stop watching after half an hour or something right or even 10 minutes so they're instantly making a snap judgment of your product that you've spent so much time and again people don't need to know how much time you spend in it it doesn't really matter to them but i'm just saying let's have that kind of empathy to understand that you know it's again it's his first thing it's going to take time he's going to get better over time and i think he's got the right people around him who are going to say it, say it how it is and allow him to grow. And I think, you know, by, but I just think now it's getting to a point where people are just being nasty in order to kind of put him off doing another special, which I don't see how that serves any purpose to anyone, right? What are you trying to make him do? Trying to have, they, they want him to have a mental breakdown. They, they get annoyed that he's not upset. They get annoyed that he keeps saying to people, I've seen people online that are getting annoyed that Brenda keeps saying, oh, thank you for the good support from people. I thank you for the good messages and all the nice reviews. What else do you think he's going to say? Do you think he's going to feed into your... Um, negative statements he's only going to put a barrier in your back like they get excited when he like loosely or you know um broadly vaguely mentions something to do with the subreddit or mention something to do with some people's comments online people get really excited imagine if he personally addresses a user it's not going to end well look how much hate or look how much um uh vitriol kevin durant gets it was getting when it was discovered he was making he had burner account defending himself or when he starts arguing with people with 50 followers on twitter people look at him like a weirdo like, you can't have it both ways. You can't be annoyed that he's not addressing you as a troll or as a hater. And you also can't be annoyed when he does come at you and, and blocks you or says something harsh. Oh, he's too sensitive. It's like, what? Doesn't make any sense. Come on, man. So again, I think, uh, give the guy a break. Lay off him. Um, again, it's, it's, only the, it's only the first special. Yes, it's only three years in. You maybe shouldn't have done it so soon. But again... Who are we to say when you should or shouldn't do anything? We're not creating specials. We're not out there on the stage. We're not out there with the weight of the world on us, the weight of our family, expectations from an entire network. Like, it's a lot of pressure to be on someone. I think his recent appearance on Joe Rogan kind of shows, like, you know, he's feeling the pressure a bit. 
And again, he needs, you know, it's, it's good to have a bit of love out there, man. A bit of love, a bit of sympathy, a bit of understanding. Like, look, it's your first one. It probably didn't go the way you wanted it to go. But like, again, recuperate and come back again stronger and you'll be fine, man. It is what it is. So again, like I said, um, lay off lay off Brendan Shaw. Let him grow. Let him get better. And if he doesn't, cool. But again, like I said in the other episode, if you don't like something, just don't watch it. What what went to... I, 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 maybe that's the nature of social media because it's just a commentary thing. You have to kind of say things. But what what what, what happened to the just not watching something you don't care about? Like, I don't understand it. It just has to be this vitro of like, oh, end him, cancel him. It's like, come on, man. It doesn't make any sense. But again, maybe that's me. Leave Ben and Shaw below. Um, what's next on the list here? Da, 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 da. We are Festival Stampede. <laughs> for obvious reasons. Um, for those of you that know, I'm laughing anyway. But I'm sure it went well. Um, there are. There's nothing more certain in life, right? I think I'm very, I'm very, I wrote I read a tweet the other day about it. Um, you know. Uh london festivals and organizational issues right or sound issues there's no there's no better duo in the world right so over the years i think i mentioned it on here previously you know my relationship with london festivals has been a little bit strained especially since i've uh had the blessing or i had the opportunity to go to primavera i think three years in a row this is the first year i'm not going I'm not going this year because um, some friends dropped out. The lineup wasn't really that great. Um, well, for the friends that I was going with, even though I'm a big fan of festivals, I still think I think sometimes festivals. I wouldn't. I would. I would argue that festivals are not about the lineup. They're more so. No, they're not about the the headliners. They're about the lineup. Right. It's about going to a, a space or a park and seeing loads of people for a really great value for money. Right. You know, uh, Primavera being a good example. I think the tickets are one fifty to two hundred pounds. Right. For the three days um which is what 60 quid a day or something like that right um so for 60 quid a day you're seeing people that you know at least one band will be 30 quid i don't think you can even i don't think you see a band for less than 30 pounds these days right i think slow tie does a few shows where he promotes them for like a fiver or 10 pounds or one pound whatever it may be that's a promotion but i think for the most part most people you're going to see even if you go see them in the real small venues it's going to be between 15 to 30 pounds so you already made your money back instantly by seeing free bands in one day. And you can easily see more than that if you are um, if you wake up early and you have a plan and you mark people you want to see on the kind of set list and whatever it may be, you can see as many people as possible. So sometimes I think, especially my friends with Primavera, they got a little bit, you know, it was a little bit annoying that they, you know, because the headliners weren't great, they everyone kind of dropped out. It's about the people that are on the lineup overall. But the problem with festivals in London isn't the lineups because usually lineups are always stellar. Mostly, most artists especially the indie ones uh, are based here or are based in Europe. They want to come and play here. Some of the American guys want to come play because, you know, the London audience is like no other or the UK audience is like no other. You get people coming down from up north, coming to London festivals here. We were really, really um, able to travel and stuff. And with the abundance of low travel, uh, low travel fares from coaches to trains, with the um, Airbnb, there's no real um, obstacle in your way to kind of come to a festival and have a good time. But the issue that we have in London festivals is the same issue we have with London club nights is that, most of the festivals are going to take part in parks where they're in really densely populated residential areas, right? And these densely populated residential areas have a real issue with sound, have a real issue with just general, you know, um, congregation of young people. They tend to not to like that sort of stuff. So it takes a long time for festivals to really garner a relationship with the local council, get to a point of agreement, make some compromises and be able to put a festival on. And I think any every festival I've been in London, whether it's Love Box, whether it's um, Field Day, whether it's Party in the Park, whatever it may be, has always had a consistent issue, and that's sound. No, organization and sound, right? You have to wait ages at the bar to get served because there's not enough bartenders, not enough bars, and you have to wait ages to get in, and you also, the sound is terrible if you're not right at the front. They can't put the volume up really loud. And it's just a horrible experience. I think having been to Primavera and having stood, I don't know, a hundred meters, maybe 200 meters away, 400 meters away from the stage when Vampire Weekend was playing and it's still being loud as fuck. I really do appreciate, I really do appreciate how much better those festivals are because, you know, it's in Barcelona. They don't care about that fucking sound. The, the playa, the, whatever it is called, um, is is right next to the beach. You no, know? again, no sound pollution there. The houses are really far away from the main site. Um, if you've been to, uh, if you've been to Primavera, you know you have to walk up in a really long rampway through the gates and then through part and then past where all the merch stands are until you get to the main part of the actual festival. So again, there's no real um, nuisance with the with the neighbors. They end exactly at 11 p.m. People will head back where they're going. It's kind of out of the way. All the residential areas. It's really set up in a way that they can blare the sound really loudly. 
but other places can't. So we are festival yesterday had an issue not with sound but with organization where people having to wait outside for six hours or so in the in the baking sun because supposedly they only had six security guards at the front of the gate searching bags six and it took too long to get through and then people just got fed up and just started rushing the gates because of course you know i'm assuming this the the stages were now filling up people were starting to play and you're missing people that you wanted to come and see and it's, it's just a great just a classic kind of like um poor organization of festival i don't think i've ever there's never been a year where one festival hasn't fucked up somewhere or the other that festival last year in south london where people were waiting for ages to get in i think the one that had solange and eric badu playing was horrible just a constant issue that keeps happening again and again and again i think it maybe it's the fact that you know most of the people that are op- may operate in these festivals are you know novices who have kind of come from the club night field and you know again taking a club night ethos and organizational capabilities and applying it to a festival with a thousand plus people is probably a lot more difficult i don't know wherever it's a constant issue and this video kind of goes to show just how dangerous that kind of lack of organization can go this is a tweet from a guy called um, alexi hicken and it says hashtag we are festival my friend filmed this i was trapped inside the tent while all this was going on clinging to a pole so i didn't get trampled on after three hours of queuing and the blaring sun it wasn't ideal right which is an understatement to say the least so these are hordes of people just running through the gates right streaming through Girls running past, guys, because again, they've just, they're taking too long to search people with tickets and stuff. People are hopping over fences. It's just annoying. And this is on the back of people just jumping over the thing anyway. So they're losing out of money because people are just, you know, jumping over gates and just getting in for free and not paying for it. Because I've seen a lot of people say that too. They go into a lot of festivals because, you know, they didn't have tickets, just jumped over the gates. And just this general lack of organization, just, it's just really, really, really um, disturbing. Gates are getting trampled down. I see, I saw a picture of, I saw some, I heard a story of a, a girl's leg got cut open and she was bleeding profusely and shit just crazy stuff to see really um again just really disturbing for people that are there i think in terms of you know parents and stuff again you, you know you, you don't let your kid go out for ages and then they beg you to go to a festival and you you hear this news you're like oh my god for people that are on the fence about going you know no pun intended you go in and you get subjected to this um for those that were happy to queue you know you're you're underneath a, a stampede of people it reminds me of that scene in um, game of thrones where Tyrion goes to fight at war and he's giving a massive speech and trying to cajole the the, the this army and they get all pumped up and they, they start running and charging and then someone smashes him with a hammer accidentally and he gets knocked out and he's knocked out for the entirety of the war and then he wakes up and the war's over and he's still alive <laughs> it's really funny it kind of reminds me of that scene um but yeah i guess not funny for the people there and again like i said it's just it's i can for as much as i can blame the um, for as much as i can blame the organizers i still think there is a part of me that's a little bit like there's lack of maturity that comes with us as well with uk festival goers we don't really know how to behave when it goes to come to these festivals we're a bit amateurish a little bit novicey a little bit childish we don't necessarily take care of each other we're we're quite self-absorbed we only care about ourselves right so at least it's kind of weird situations where no one's patient enough to just wait in the queue because again we're all late right we're all here together there's no rush um it's it's adamant it's, it's equivalent to the people on the planes that you know that rush to get their hand luggage off the plane we're all going to get off roughly the same sort of time you're not going to be that much in front of you really right i'm probably going to see you at a taxi rank or at the bus stop it's like you know just take your time um and queue but people don't intend to do that tend to I mean, look after their own self-interest and again it leads us to this example and i think there's loads of evidence of this on the twitter feed as well people are complaining about um the security being doing too much as videos here I think of a security guard maybe dragging somebody out. Oh, the, the security got a bit fucked up. I think as well as a picture there. <laughs> video. Um, yeah, we are first again. More more news articles from the BBC News talking about it. actually. Let's see, let's see what the BBC News had to say. They're probably gonna give a few more details about the whole issue. Um, we are festival. People collapse after hours of queuing at the gates. Um, it says here the following some festival goers collapse after long queues um led to crowds pushing through security gates at london, london festival videos and photos of social media appear to show a rush through the gates some ticket holders told radio one newsbeat they left the site without getting into the event which is a really sad case right organizers have apologized for the, for the problems of course apologies are always accepted but you know they're not going to give refunds the two-day festival is held in east london and its saturday lineup included chasing status and bugs in malone and cam and camel fat um 
eyewitness say the lack of wristbands meant that people had to queue in front of temperature in, in hot temperatures in, in that mister which led to people charging past staff and onto the event which is true because i remember when i was djing the other day at, um, at, at west at westfield um it was quite dead on the saturday and i was you know again you know probably um no it was quite dead on the saturday yeah for the most part I was wondering like, why was everybody not there, and then I think I saw a few. Was it Saturday or Sunday? I forgot what day it was, but I was in Tappies. I saw loads of girls walking by with festival outfits. I was like, oh, I wonder where they're going. I was like, oh yeah, we are festival. So they had quite a big group of people going there. I think it's the festival that most of the general public tend to go to during this sort of time because it's got quite a good array, a good lineup, a good kind of assortment of art. It's from different sort of genres and stuff. But yeah, like I mentioned, just not the most safest kind of uh, place to be when people are stampeding. Um, and they say, um, this is another quote from somebody that was there. They'd run out of wristbands at the door so they didn't have drink tokens wristbands when they were letting people through. One 20-year-old female said who didn't want to be named. They weren't handing out water so everyone in the queue for, for three hours didn't have a drink again, which is really nuts, right? This kind of reminds me of Tanaka. They took out the barriers and pushed through security. The woman says she was standing near people vomiting in the fence off area and claims that the staff nearby offered no help before the rush of the gates. A barrier got thrown into the crowds. The woman next to me got hit by it and it sliced their mess chunk out of her leg oh yeah 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 and if you've seen the barriers in real life you know how fucking heavy and sharp the bottoms of them are even the top where they kind of connect mama mia she passed out on the floor security ran over to her and people were just charging through they took out the barriers pushed through the security punching security just taking everyone out on their way again like i said lack of maturity from festival girls will make again don't get me wrong um we are first of all terrible organization i think for the most part there's a lot of people online that are saying that they're really poor um, organizing of festivals they treat the djs really badly they treat the customers really badly they um commercial the organizer of it is, seems like a little bit of a dickhead for the most part but there is a part of me that's also you know the punters are going to these things have to be a lot more responsible and look after each other like we're all in this together we're all standing out here hot we're all we're all we're all hot we're all baking in the sun let's look after each other let's not be dickheads let's chill the fuck out but they don't do that they just kind of consistently you know i don't know just treat everyone with absolute this um disregard and it leads to a point where people are getting you know stretched out of a festival event before even never seen an artist um she left, the, she left the festival earlier so yeah this is another clip again of people what's this video show mama mia that the bar oh is that that's the get in right <laughs> look at that cue <laughs> honestly what the fuck is going on it's just like a sea of people oh my god Again, I never saw this at Primavera. Primavera ticket entry was amazing, sublime, right? You walk up the rampway, security are standing there like in a huge line through the gates and there's massive bins there. They make sure you take out all your water bottles and stuff. They make sure you've got a wristband before you actually even enter through the thing, through the gate. So they take your water bottle, they take to take, to take your lid off or you can't bring in the alcohol in, whatever you do. Then if you've got a wristband, you go straight through. If you don't have a wristband, there's, to the left-hand side, there's ticket. Um, there's like a, a ticket kiosk area that's kind of labeled, I think from the numbers or the, your surname, I've got it away, so, so it's kind of split up into chunks. So maybe one to a, one to 100, 100, 101 to 200, like that, like six or seven stations. And the girls and guys on there are super quick with kind of checking your details, making sure you've got everything, giving you a wristband, giving you a card that you have to make sure you keep on you. And then you kind of make your exit through there and you head in straight into the uh, gates. And then from there, they um, scan your card uh scan your wristband or check your wristband and you go straight through really quick process i don't think i waited more than 10 minutes to get in ever in pre and this was during the peak times when everyone's going to see a particular band or you're going to see a particular you're going to a particular time especially on, on the first day never waited around always 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 going there as quick as always going for as quick as possible but the only times i've had this sort of like you know meat market there's always been london festivals whether it's love box whether it's this I mean, whether it's field day, it's all the same thing. It's always the same thing. And again, it's annoying because the festivals have good lineups, man. They're usually in places that, are, and again, it's like, it's, you know, Barcelona is, is not the most expensive place to go to in Europe, but you're still having to pay a hundred or so pounds plus for an air, for a flight, 200 quid for an Airbnb if you're staying on your own, or maybe maybe less than 200 if you're with a group, um, spending money, um, money for food. You're having to, there's a lot of expenditure there. So if you can afford to go to a festival in East London and take the, you know, the circle line or whatever it may be called and get there right you would like to go wouldn't you right even with the sound issues but the what you don't want is this sort of thing i'd take a level i'll take a decrease in sound and maybe the ability to see my favorite band in around the area that i live in but i wouldn't take this as a minute i wouldn't take two things i wouldn't take the sound issues and this general lack of organization and still go it's not worth the hassle 
which is why I'm hoping to go Junction 2 isn't as shit. But I don't think so because the reviews so far I've seen online have been quite good. Uh, the the videos I've seen of the of the stages have been quite good too and quite encouraging. I think the fact that they've got diff, little different stages set up everywhere, it kind of stops the ability not to have good sound issues. Um, the fact that it's in the middle of Boston Manor Park underneath a motorway maybe helps with the sound issues. They can kind of ramp up a little bit. I'm hoping these are all true. Um, the lady said she, when she left, she saw ambulances and police vans arriving on the site. In a statement to Newsbeat, the Metropolitan Officer said, Officers are at the location, working alongside organizers with Lambert Ambulance. We're not aware of any serious injury apart from obviously. Look, look at the VIP queue. Look at that. Mamma mia. <laughs> Um, festival goer Ronaldo Henry traveled from Birmingham for the festival that's a bit where it gets annoying I guess if you're a kid that kind of turned up from um, outside of London to go these kind of things annoying I think when you're in London and you've been to enough you know park park themed park festival stuff even stuff in London fields is shit Victoria Park is fucking garbage right events you've been to enough of those little community events where you know the standards are going to be that high but again you'll take all the errors to kind of sit somewhere local, hang out with your friends, not have to travel too much, not spend too much money. You know what I mean? There's little compromises that you make. But when you travel from down from Birmingham, um, East, um, the Birmingham kid says, we were in the queue, four people had collapsed around us. People were throwing up and shouting for medics. All the staff were doing was throwing water bottles into them. <laughs> like that video of Trump. Um, where was he? In that, uh, where was he? In the state somewhere in America where they had like a, a tornado or a hurricane or something. And you've given aid or relief and you're throwing fucking kitchen towels at <laughs> like a basketball into the crowd. <laughs> I should throw water bottles at you, man. If a water bottle, a, a full water bottle that hits you without you knowing is going to hit you, that's going to hurt, you know. That might take out an eye. Like, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> oh, people are crawling on the floor and crying. Oh, the lack of honesty. So many people that... I don't know how... To, Honestly, sometimes in life, yeah, you get, oh man, it's so hard to put stuff on, it's hard to organize things, life is, you know, I can't do this, this takes talent, no, 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 sometimes look at these big events, you're like, you know what, you could do better if you decide to make an event, spend an, a, a, at least a year, 18 months, putting an event on, hiring people, booking your favorite artists, specking places out, going through all the details that need to be done, and you could probably put on a better event for a group of 500 people, you could probably do it, which is why it explains, which is what explains a lot of these club nights and bars like jazz cafe and stuff are putting on their own the festivals because there are some real amateur hours out there putting on events man everything gets outsourced there's no personal accountability they're just doing it again to add another uh chink to their cv or to appeal a call or something there's no real love for the music no real love for the people that are attending your event it's just a cash grab you want to get as many sponsors as you can on board to make money and then to kind of flip it and sell it to an AIG later on down the line or something. It's really devoid of any soul, any personality, right? Even sometimes the statements they put out on their Twitter and Facebook, it's like just, you know, regurgitated bullshit. Um, it was, and then anyway, it says the following, um, he was also involved in the crash at the entrance. Um, everyone at the back of us was just pushing towards us. Um, the Birmingham kid says, I turned around to see my friends getting crushed by other people. People were just coming out there crawling, crying because they'd been trampled on. It was ridiculous. And what security was doing was just trying to push people back. But he says his two friends will return to We Are Festival on Sunday to try and get in again for a festival's second day. The festival has put up a statement offering sincere apologies. Again, sincere apologies are like thoughts and prayers, isn't it, for people that are the, uh, at the end of fucking um, school shootings. It's literally the most emptiest statement you could ever say, right? Because you know it's not going to be any better on the Sunday. It's just, they're just going to be less people there because they decided not to turn up. The demands on the staff are going to be less, but they're going to be the same thing. See, they tried to get away with putting on the festival with six or so security guards at the gate. Because, again, it's not their fault. It's the operational issues that's allowing them to fail at their position, right? Not enough people. Not enough ports of entry. Um, the queue manager system not being set up properly. Um, refreshments. Um, not enough medics. Uh, water staff. Whatever. Maybe all these things are what lead to these kind of debacles happening. But again, personal accountability does it exist. Probably not. People come back in again and give them money. Probably yes. Um, so yeah, that happened. And then All Points East, another London-based festival, um, which kind of had loads of really good people playing there. I think it had the return of um, the Killers playing. Right? Is it the Killers? Who played there? Is it the killers? I think it's the killers, right? Is it killers? Must be the killers. I think it was the killers. The return on stage. So again, another great festival that seemed on paper to, you know, be destined for success turned into an absolute failure because of sound issues. This is a common issue again for festivals, but I think when you go to see a band like the killers or other, you know, uh I think Johnny Marr played as well. 
I feel I think this is a really good lineup anyway. I think CD's kind of banned. You want to hear the music. You want to hear it loud as fuck. And again, didn't get that issue. There's a tweet from a, a guy called um, Dan Simmons. He says, hashtag all points east is a waste. People are leaving at 10 p.m. Uh, because of sound issues. Unbelievable. This is the atmosphere you've created. And this is a video of the actual sound, right? So there's a sa- there's a band playing and you can't hear anything. <laughs> <laughs> and they were just standing around like it's just and again this represents to me how good it was to be at primavera we were so far back during the set of vampire weekend and it was so lively people around us dancing the sound being really loud and this is the complete opposite with this at um at all points east just again just terrible 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 um organization and again the statement that they put out again just empty as of per usual um uh, I think it's got it here on the on the page. It says, thanks to the strokes for last night's incredible show. The sound quality at our shows has been consistently high, which is really funny to say because All Point Seats only started last year, right? Or I think from, yeah, so it's like two years, not consistency, right? I don't think that's consistent. Um, high standards, we started in 2018. And, oh, yeah, 2018. So it's like two, one year. They, they, they found it last year, and it says, weird phrasing, we were disappointed to learn that there was a sound issue in some areas of the site, some areas, all areas, read on, right? And that's a kind of empty statement they put out there, which I think a lot of people were not too pleased about. But again, what do you expect them to say? You know, they're not going to necessarily put their hands up and say we did a bad job because festivals never do that. They always try and blame outside forces because if they say they've done a bad job, it means they have to give them refunds and they don't want to do that. And again, just a really, really um, bad way to kind of run a festival. We've got another video here of another video showing the poor sound quality. Um, this is from a user called Alicia Forsberg. Um, she says here in a tweet, amazing to see the strokes again. Oh, sorry, the strokes, not the killers, the strokes. Um, but we could barely hear anything. What went wrong with the sound? All point C's video of the sta- of people shouting. This is something while they're playing, turning it up, right? Look. Yeah, that's nothing, man. But it's not loud enough. Yeah, keep people saying, turn it up, turn it up. Keep it, turn it up, turn it up. Mama mia, man. Got to feel sorry for these guys, man. Especially the ba- I feel sorry for more for the band, right? The band themselves, you got to feel sorry for them because they know what the issues, is, but you just got to be a trooper and just push through. I remember a comedian saying this before once, like even if you're like, I'll take this into account when I'm DJing. Even if you're playing for a crowd of one, you just always have to kind of bring it like you're playing in front of a group of, you know, you're playing for a sold out show in fucking the O2. You have to just kind of bring it because that builds good habits. Um, it builds up your showmanship. And again, a, a level of professionalism that no matter the circumstances, you always put on a good show. Um, you'd never let it be known to the public that you're having a bad night. It's always consistently good, right? And that's something I've tried to do um, my, with my in my career going forward. Um, but yeah, man, terrible organization. Again, I think for the people that went, um, you know, I think it's a good lesson learned. I think you have to kind of be aware that London festivals by and large are this bad. I think there's reason why some of the best festivals are outside London that you have to kind of travel to, you have to kind of camp with again, which is annoying and frustrating. But I think taking the time, saving up a little bit of money, maybe t- t- telling your friends ahead of time, hey, let's go to this kind of thing and put them down. And sometimes even going solo, because sometimes going with a group of friends, it can be difficult because not everyone's on board with the same sort of festival. It can be hard to get everyone um, organized. But I think t- using taking that extra step and going an extra mile can really help in your overall festival experience. And, you know, it could put pressure on these London festivals to maybe um, seek better relationship with councils. They can increase the sound limits or not put on this festival at all if it's not going to be a good show, right? It doesn't make any sort of sense. But again, like I said, some of these festivals are not in it for the love of the music, in it for just for money and just to kind of get notoriety and to kind of sell it on to a parent company after, uh, afterwards. Kind of like they kind of run it like startups, right? They, the big goal is to make money, make a good product. The big goal is to attract an investor and to kind of, you know, go buy it out and then to you to kind of go sit on the beach somewhere in Barbados. And then, you know, the who suffers at the end of it? Us, the consumers. Same old story. Anyway, that's it for now. Thank you so much for tuning in to the 200th episode of the Excellent Zinger Show. It's been a pleasure to have your company today. Um, I'll see you guys again tomorrow for another episode of the show. Before that, 
Or if you want to check out anything to do with me regarding my DJ dates and when I'm playing out or anything else, check out my website, which is linked below. I've also got a new social, I've also got a new Instagram account because I don't know why, but my Instagram deleted my Instagram profile that had 2,000 or so followers on it. Again, you know, what can you do? Shit happens. So check out my new Instagram page, which is in the show notes. It's um, DJ Handsome Black Man, all one word. DJ Handsome Black Man, check that out. Be uploading on there quite regularly now. Um, it's a bit detached from me as a person, so that would be good to kind of get that on there. Um, check out my website com for links regarding myself and i'll see you guys again tomorrow for an episode episode of the show um and again thank you so much for those guys who tuned in for the last 200 or so shows hopefully the quality will continue to uh, you know continue to get better over the years hopefully i don't know maybe it'll improve maybe it won't i hope it hopefully it will i'm trying to make it improve it new camera new microphone coming very soon um no guest still you know it's fun to do it on my own i prefer this sort of stuff i'm a lone soldier and i'll see you guys again very very soon thanks so much for checking me out and speak again tomorrow peace